My name is Mordechai Livni, formerly Max Lieben. When famous people are murdered, if it's a statesman or a king, an artist or maybe a general, their memory is perpetuated for many generations by stone statues. When simple people are murdered, they are usually forgotten very fast. In the following lecture by my daughter Leora is perpetuating the memory of my father's family, the Liebens, to preserve their memory from erasure from history. Good evening, my name is Leora Livni Cohen, daughter of Max Livni, formerly Lieben, a survivor of Ghetto Theresienstadt and one of the founders of Beit Theresien in Kibbutz Givat Chaim, Israel. In the past 80 years, I served as treasurer of Beit Theresien. In 2007, I started researching mainly my mother's side of the family, the tales from the Triangle, Bratislava, Vienna, Budapest. I built a significant family tree that is based on the work of my parents and other family members before them. It evolved to include also distant relatives and families of relatives by marriage based on a self-imposed guideline that I add whoever is somehow related up to the period of the Holocaust. This decision came from the realization that sometimes it would be their only commemoration, the only place where they will have a space of their own within their extended family. At a certain point, I put my mother's family aside and took the time to upload to the web my father's side, the Lieben family from Prague. Prague community, Park community is well researched by many pros. First and foremost, Randy Schoenberg, a member of our association and a generous donor. Collaboration made my work much easier and nowadays I mainly update the tree with current news, birth, marriages and death. The advantage of genealogical research in 2021 is that a lot can be done from one one's own home. Websites like Jewish Gen, the Austrian Gen team, and Dev, uh, Czech Badatelna and Holocaust sites, Yad Vashem, Bad Aurusen, Ellis Island, and many others are open to the public online, either for digi digitization of documents or the documents themselves. One of my main goals in, bin in building family trees is to find as many personal stories and details as possible. Beside putting names and dates in the right places on the tree in order to enrich raw data with real characters, to find photos and documents that will broaden our knowledge and turn them as much as possible into the people they really were.
This city with its turrets, towers, and alleys is where my father spent his childhood. The general view has not changed much. The castle, the Jewish quarter, the squares, the bridges over the Vrtova. These were the natural background of the people whose story I'm about to tell, those who perished in the Holocaust. We hear testimonies of Holocaust survivors with their horrifying stories. The stories of those who perished, we do not hear. Truth is, the fact that they perished in the Holocaust is not what defined them. And I'm trying here to rise to the challenge of making real people from a list of names. Already today, we do not have pictures of all of them. We do not know exactly who they were, except for their slot on the family tree, birth date, and the fact that they perished. As the list is very long, I chose to focus on a few characters to shed some light on their lives and the people they were before the world got mad. After the war, my father wrote to his family in the United States in English, aided by his landlady. In this let letter, he described in detail everything that had happened to his nuclear family since the outset of war till his liberation, including the death of his parents and his brother, Woody. Here are some original excer excerpts from this letter. In 1943, we were deported with thousand other Jewish families to the ghetto Theresienstadt. In the ghetto, our father fell sick on open tuberculosis of the lungs. Woody and I endeavored to gain for our parents better and more food. In October 1944, we stood before the Konzentrationslager Oswiecin, Auschwitz, Rudy and I were found able for hard work and 10 days after our arrival, <coughs> were deported again away. This time, 80 persons in each wagon to the concentration camp Kaufering, a branch of Dachau. At first, the meals were relatively sufficient, but later it got worse in quantity and quality so that we got 17 decagram moldy bread, one liter yellow liquid, cold soup, and twice a week, a bit of artificial fat or cheese. This was, of course, absolute insufficient for hard working. And my brother, Rudy, died on the second evening of Hanukkah at the age of 21. The diagnosis is anti-Semitism. On April 30, 1945, my father was liberated by the Americans, he wrote. Three weeks later, we were repatriated to Prague. All the time, I hope that my parents left in the ghetto and that I shall find them there, but the providence decided otherwise. Our parents were deported from the ghetto one month after us. They were sent to Oswiecim and killed there in the gas chambers. The thought that they had to suffer as much as we did, and at least, at last to die, leads me to the result that this relatively quick kind of murdering was more merciful. I hope they did not know before that they were sent for execution. These stories and those of my mother became part of who I am. It is possible that this was the foundation for what has become my hobby and life project, family research. My sister and I did not grow up with a feeling of loss or deprivation. Our parents made every effort and succeeded that there would not be a feeling of loneliness or sadness of a small family. We were never alone during the holidays. There were always people, mostly friends, around us. The optimism, love of nature, and humankind is a direct outcome of this upbringing. Nevertheless, like many others, I had the need to know who I am, what are my roots, and who were the people that under different circumstances could have been a part of my childhood scene. In 1938, there were over 50 Lieben family members from Prague alive. 39 of them did not survive. 
from my father's close family, descendants of his grandmother, 19 were murdered. Two survived. My uncle Avraham, who was already in Palestine, and my father. The Liban family lived in Prague for hundreds of, hundreds of years, and the language spoken within the family was German. Czech was street language. When they were ousted out of town in the 18th century, they settled in nearby Liban, and when Jews were allowed back into town, the name Liban was given to them. Prior to this, they were called Menakel, and this name appears on some of the earlier tombstones of the family. The Liban family was virtuous and very orthodox. They used to pray separately in one of the few private minyanim in Prague before the war. Its location changed several times during the demolition of the former Jewish quarter. As of the 20, 1920s, the shul was in the apartment of Dr. Berli Aiteles, brother of my, father, my father's grandmother, in a complex of buildings that belonged to the Hevra Kadisha. It was called the Liban Shul. The shul was mainly for the families Liban and the Aiteles, as well as some strangers, all in all some 35 men, Women came only during holidays in Shabbat <clears throat> and prayed at a smaller room in that apartment. Each man had his own seat and room for his top hat, talit, and siddur. There was no gabai or canter, and they all shared the duties. The first floor of this building hosted the conference room of the Hevra Kadisha, and the there they pray during high holidays. We do know very little. The only one who really knew them and can tell their story is my father, with whom I sat for hours, challenging his excellent memory. Uncle Mami, Salomon Menachem Lieben, my grandfather's eldest brother, was the doctor uncle. He was born in 1884 to Ernestina Neiteles and the glove maker, Gabriel Lieben. Uncle Mami, studied medicine at Charles University and became a physician and a mohel around 1910. He married Tzipora Neshifer and they, were, they had three sons, one of which at least was born in Radom, Poland, while the family was there probably from 1911 for seven years. He was a member of Agudat Israel and served as a representative of the Orthodox Jewry in the Jewish Community Council. During the establishment of the first Czechoslovak Republic, he strived for equality for Jews and was a member of the National Jewish Council that was established in 1918 as a Zionistic initiative. He was active in the Central Jewish Welfare Office and other charity organizations. Mani was known as the doctor of the poor because he took care of them for free. The silver cup in the picture he received from the Berlin Jewish Hospital where he worked for a while. Amira Tratner from the US who is in this crowd, I believe, to edit now, told me that Dr. Lieben was the family doctor and a friend. When her mother got married in 1934, he gave her an Eliyahu Hanavi goblet that was already an antique back then. This goblet made its way to what was then Palestine, from there to the US, and it is still in use every year for the Seder. 
As a community doctor, he was the model for the film Skeleton on Horseback by Hugo Haas, based on the book The White Play by Carl Chapek. There was a rumor that the only patients who paid for his services were the Petchett family, one of the richest family in Prague. Salomon Lieben wrote several medical articles about kosher slaughtering being the least cruel method. Being prominent in the Liebenschul, he asked a young music student, Sigmund Schul, to list the collection of religious chants he had. They worked together from 1935 until their deportation in 1941. The result of their work is a collection of chants of Schul's in Old Prague. An unpublished manuscript, including more than 200 transliterations, of religious chants is kept at the Jewish Museum in Prague with copies at the Czech Music Museum and the National Library in Jerusalem. My father's memories. Uncle Manny was in a good economic position, but one did not spend money. Using a public phone, you were required to insert a coin, then hear the recipient, but they could only hear you after you pushed the button that collected the coin. Uncle Manny walked every morning to visit his patients and from time to time called home. In his, if his wife heard nothing, she disconnected. Manny would call again silently and she told him if there were more patients waiting for him. Then Uncle Manny disconnected and retrieved the coin. One should not spend money. At the corner of Manny's desk, there was a mini manual centrifuge that was used for urine tests. When he had to perform a circumcision in one of the villages out of town, he took a taxi and sometimes took one of his nephews for the ride. Always the same red taxi, which he called the Red Dog, the Rote Kelev, Kelev, the original in Hebrew. The biochemist Ira Volinsky from Houston, Texas, visited Sofia, Bulgaria in 1986. He met a journalist there who told him that he had a Jewish prayer book with the name of the owner and gave it to him. Ira Volinsky took the trouble to find my father, my father's name in Yad Vashem, on the page of testimony he submitted for Uncle Mani. On Ira's next visit to Israel, he gave the book to my father. The Nazis arrested Mani in summer 1941. They reported him to Dachau, and in March 1942, he was sent to Schloss Hartheim near Salzburg in Austria, where he was murdered in a gas chamber. Uncle Mani has a tomb in Prague, where a cardboard box with ashes that his wife Tsipora got after she paid the Gestapo for it. Uh, today we know that the ashes were not his. Ernestine was born in Prague and was the eldest daughter of Yitzhak David Yaiteles and Anna Netevelis. She was known as Tina, but the children, of course, were not allowed to call her that. Her shiduch with Gabriel Lieben was set at a very young age. And years later, letters they wrote to each other were found. 16-year-old Tina wrote, Dear and beloved Gabriel, till a hundred years, you cannot envision how happy your letter of Saturday, made, of Saturday night made me. I already thought that someone was planning to find our letter. Today when I got your letter, though late, I'm totally relieved and complain only about the incompetence of the mailman. Regarding the little handmade thing you expect to get on Fridays between Passover and Pentecost, I already replied to you. Had I wanted to count this week, the outcome is somewhat better, although not entirely satisfactory. You should make an effort to have a better result next week. As for a solution for Wednesday, I already advised you in person, so again, if the weather is good, a walk at noon. In bad weather, only come up. Today was an exception because in the morning, not only we did not talk, we did not even see each other. 
I did hear you enter the room to take the keys, but then Mama came and said, this morning I would not see you. I only hope that the Yaitelis business and trade will let my beloved betrothed to come a quarter of an hour earlier. And poured with this hope, I conclude my letter with blessings and kissing you many times. I remain loving you with all my heart, Ernestine. known as the Three Feathers House here. The house is still there, diagonally from the old clock across the beautiful square, Staumeski Namisti. Any family member traveling to Prague will stop there for a moment and smile at the sign. Grandma Tina was known as a tough person, at least in the eyes of my father as a child. When a new maid started to work, she would ask her for her name and right away added, it doesn't matter, I will call you Anna. That's how I call all my maids. Already then, it was customary to give a two week notice. At the beginning of each month, she would fire the maid and one day before it became effective, she would cancel. That way she ensured herself of redundant expense, expenses. Her younger brother, Bill, who was single, came every day for lunch. She would scold him as if he was a little boy. My father remembers, when we were still small kids, we met grandma every day at the market where she exchanged news with her daughter and daughters in law. One day she said to me, you wet your bed again tonight. I answered, I did, but how do you already know that? She said, the little bird watching your window came to me and told me. I believed her. On another occasion, Tina and Hansi, my grandmother, bought identical glass jugs. That afternoon, when my father came to visit, he exclaimed, look, here is our jug, and was reprimanded. How dare he suggest that grandma stole something? Grandma Tina was a widow who lived with her maid. Her children installed a phone for her so that she was able to call her son, the Dr. Uncle Money. The phone was a wooden box the size of a shoe box and the earpiece hung on the wall. Grandma turned a handle and said to the microphone, Foyline, give me my son, please. The operator knew exactly who was Frau Lieben's son. Prague counted about a million inhabitants at the time. Grandma Tina was the glue that kept the family together. Her three sons, her daughter, and her 12 grandchildren were her world. She was one of the main reasons my grandfather did not make use of the opportunity he had to emigrate with his family to England in time. Ernestina was sent to Terezin in July 1942 at the age of 78 and died there six weeks later. Cause of death listed on her death notice, heartbeat disorder. Hansi, my grandmother, who was never a grandmother, was born in Schwabach, Germany, to Avraham and Leanne Goldschmidt as the ninth of the 10 children and the only one who perished. All the others fled Germany in time and survived. Avraham, her father, was a real character. At an early stage, he became independent and his relations with his parents, especially his father, were rocky. After several business failures, he started a business manufacturing gold leaf from which he made a decent living and his relationship with his parents improved as well. He made two voyages to Eretz Israel to improve the, situations, the situation of the Jews in Jerusalem. He was one of the founders of Sharit Tzedek Hospital, where he died during his second trip. 
is buried on the Mount of Olives. Many of his descendants were born in this hospital. Esther, one of Hans's sister, was deaf and dumb. In order to give her the best education possible, the whole family moved from Schwabach to Nuremberg. She lived a long life and died in Haifa at the age of 89. During the First World War, still single, Hansi took a nursing course and served as a nurse at a German field hospital. Towards Abraham Grunbaum's second trip to Jerusalem, he and his wife Leah met through a matchmaker, Gabriel and Ernestine Lieber, in Marienbad. The Grunbaums had a daughter who was already 27 but the Lieben son, Eugen, finished his PhD and was teaching at the gymnasium in Prague. The Shidduch was set and Eugen was invited to Nuremberg to meet the intended. Hansi, being very shy, while setting the table, put a tall flower vase between her place and his. Her father noticed and said, Hansi, stell me Blumenweg. Hansi, put the flowers away a phrase that is still in use in the family to this day. Hansi moved to Prague and became a part of the Lieben family. She never learned Czech, but for the few words she needed on the street or the maid. Often she and Eugen went to visit the family in Nuremberg. She learned from her Slovak sister-in-law, Julia, how to bake strudels. The family in Nuremberg were very impressed with her new skill, and each time they went, she brought a lot of various strudels. Once they took the Friday train, and it, it was snowed down at the border in Eger. They managed to send the cable, buy candles, and find a hotel room before Shabbat. Dinner, breakfast, and lunch were strudel. Shabbat out, they took the next train to Nuremberg, strudel-less. Hansi knew and loved swimming. Eugen did not, but was aware that the children should be taught. He did think that once they knew, there was no reason to continue with this waste of time. Hansi convinced him that to maintain the skill, one should practice all the time. She and the children kept enjoy swimming in the Moldau. Like many others, other wives, she used to cut corners. She got a weekly allowance for house expenses and had to report details. Never the ends met. The item that became her savior, children's shoe soles. It is impossible to understand how often children's shoes need, need repair. During the summer, the family rented a house in the country. The whole kitchen, dairy and meat, was packed. Bed linen, clothing, everything. Hansi sat at the front with the driver while the kids and the maid Set with the packages in the back. Eugen joined them for weekends. Many Jewish families did the same. Some of them had a summer house there and some rented from the farmers who went to live in the barn for the summer. The family, the children managing the house were her world. She did her shopping in the markets and at the butchers, cooked, hosted seven blessings feasts and other festive meals for relatives. Knitted, baked a lot, and once a week she had a girls' meeting at a cafe in Prague with friends and sisters-in-law. Told the German tradition, she was very punctual. The children had to be at home for lunch at midday sharp. In general, she was good-natured and not an angry person. But if the need arose, she enlisted hierarchy. This I will tell you, Father. There was no hugging or kisses, but for the mandatory kiss on the forehead on Shabbat evening. This confirms my opinion. The little touching in our home, a second generation, was more a matter of culture than Holocaust related. With the rise of Nazi regimes in Germany, Hansi no longer took the kids to Nuremberg, but kept going herself. In 1935, her mother died and her siblings started leaving Germany. On the way, they stopped in Prague and there were long conversations into the night with the conclusion, well, this is Germany. Here, it cannot happen. 
relatively late in July 1943, been in key roles with the community, Eugen, Hansi, Rudi, and Marx were sent to Theresienstadt. Avraham left in time for Palestine. Beginning October 1944, Rudi and Marx were deported to Auschwitz. The parents, three weeks later, and were killed in Auschwitz. Rudi was born in 1924 and was the middle son of Hansi and Eugen. The three boys were two years apart from each other. My father recalls that as long as Abraham was still at home till 1939, the two older boys ganged up on him and only after Abraham left, he became closer to Rudi. When they were little, their mother knitted two identical orange overalls, like in the children's story, Himperschen und Pimperschen. Rudi and my father had to learn the roles and to perform before their grandmother in Nuremberg. There are only a few photos. Once a year, there was a mandatory visit to the photographer. In the pictures, neat and well-behaved children. When they were older and Avraham left, both Rudi and my father became less and less religious. They did so secretly and outwardly kept as usual, head covering, going twice a day to shul, etc. But there were many discussions and a lot of stress around it. Like both his brothers, Rudi was a good people. There was no option at the house of Professor Dr. Eugen Lieben. When Abraham left, letters were sent regularly. Rudi wrote in April 1939, Father asked that you number all your letters and write dates so that we know if there were some lost on the way. On Thursday, the first day of Hola Moed, as well as Friday and Saturday, Saturday evning, we baked a klimush. By we baked, he means baking matzes in a place their cousin Gabi managed. In this exchange of letters, several cousins complained that Rudy became a member of Bnei Akiva instead of Agudat Israel, and that he enticed other young people to join him, which caused endless arguments with his father. They asked his elder brother to call him to order. Rudy didn't write so much. He was probably afraid of the criticism. In June 1939, Rudy wrote, I went on a bike ride with Freda in Boleslav and Bandis, and we swam in the Elbe. Do you talk a little bit in Hebrew or only mother tongue? A month later on Tisha B'Av Eve. Mom cooked spinach from kohlrabi leaf yesterday. It was impossible to eat. After Rosh Hashanah, on Rosh Hashanah, I blew shofar many times. On the first holiday, for Marcus and for others who could not get to the synagogue. At the onset of war, when schools were prohibited for Jews, Rudy followed in his mother's step and enrolled at a nursing school. In addition, he took photography and carpentry. In August 39, he wrote to Avraham. Yesterday, I supplied an ark to Bnei Akiva, my own design and production. Dr. Valeria ordered a flower box. The ark for Bnei Akiva raised a lot of anger at home, as well as with the cousins, who were all with the Gudat Israel. Rudy joined Maccabi Atzair, a Zionistic youth movement. The management of the movement was situated in the flat adjacent to, their, to theirs, and there was a Kabbalat Shabbat party on Fridays. After Friday's evening meal, when the boys went to the room, Rudy would arrange the bed so that it looked as if he were lying there in case someone came to say goodnight. He sneaked out through the bathroom window into the adjacent flat and took part in the festivities. Late at night, he came back the same way. He was never caught. The caricature was drawn by Freddy Hirsch in Prague where, when he was head of the sports activity there in 1941. Woody coached groups of kids and youth at the Maccabi Tseir sports field. The tension between the two worlds is evident. Woody wears a kippah, but is uncharacteristically muscular and sportive looking. In July 19
43, the family was sent to Terezin. Woody was at first a youth leader and then worked at the vegetable garden. He and my father used to visit their parents in their little room in the ghetto every day, and if they managed, also brought something to eat. During wartime, Woody had two girlfriends, both with the name Ruth. My father were deported to the East to build a new labor camp. They believed it up to the moment they arrived in Auschwitz. Both were found fit for hard labor and shortly thereafter were sent to Kaufring, a sub camp of Dachau. Rudy started to work as a carpenter, but soon was a part of a big group sent for construction work, building huge underground holes intended to act as airplanes and ammunition plants. The work was to carry 50 kilo cement sacks all day long. Beginning December 1944, Rudy fell ill and died on December 11, 1944, second candle of Hanukkah. Documents received later from Dachau and Terezin indicate that date as January 5, 1945. The reason was probably because the block elderste, the person in charge of the living quarters, did their best to delay announcing death even for weeks at a time to continue getting the food rations for the dead. Eugen Lieben was the second son of the glove maker Gabriel Lieben and Ernestine. He studied classic philosophy at Carl Ferdinand University in Prague and graduated with a philosophy PhD. He taught ancient languages and history at a German speaking high school in the old city of Prague. The pupils called, called him Koza Lieben. Koza is a goat in Czech, and indeed he had an appropriate goatee. He also managed the school's library and later became a professor. His pupils thought he was an excellent teacher and he was very much liked. Once a student asked him, for years you are trying to show us the positive and best of human, human ideals. Do you believe you achieved something? His answer, I've been teaching now for 25 years, three years every year with an average of 30, three classes every year with an average of 30 pupils per class. This is about 2,000 pupils altogether. Let's assume a half of them did not listen at all. That leaves 1,000. From these, a half forgot everything after a month. From the rest, a half forgot after a year. And a half of the remaining forgot everything after 10 years. There we have about 100 people who absorbed something of the sublime ideas I tried to teach them. I managed to multiply, multiply myself 100 times, not a trifle matter. In addition to teaching, he was active in the community, science and press. He wrote a few articles about the biography of a Roman poet, as well as Jewish history, Jewish customs and anti-Semitism. As a part of his work for the community, he was involved in fundraising worldwide, including the joint. Corresponding with his, with his older brother, Mani, who was then in Berlin and Radom, Poland, they discussed halachaic issues and different interpretations, mitzvot and halachas. There's very little mentioning of mundane issues. A major part of this correspondence was in Hebrew, beautiful, old biblical Hebrew. Eugen married Hansi in 1918. Four years later, their eldest, Arthur Avraham, was born, and then, with two years' gaps, Rudy and my father. Eugen was not involved in the daily life of the boys, but did take interest in their learning, achievements, and discipline. If he heard from Hansi that one of the kids did not behave himself, he would not hesitate to use corporal punishment. He also took an interest in the children's reading material, which had to be serious and enriching. He would get very angry if something broke, even a match, because it was a waste. The picture here plays tricks with my imagination. 
the vivid evidence that this austere, noble, cold and remote man is kneeling for a family picture with the hint of a smile on his face does not fit with the image I had of him since I was a child. I tried to imagine what kind of a grandfather he could have been and was unable to. He kind of scared me. Later, when I read things he wrote or people wrote about him, I understood that he had many facets. Among other things, my father tells that although he had little regard for nature, when he saw an ant on the pavement, he would make an extra effort not to step on it. Despite his extensive education, he never went to a concert because since the destruction of the temple, Jews should not listen to music, he said. Naturally, he never went to a church, although Prague is full of them. And if his pupils went on a class tour, he would ask a colleague to take his place. He was a devout, humble, and Puritan Jew. On Yom Kippur Eve, he would ask one of his brothers to beat him 40 times while half naked. Despite that, he did not wear a head covering while at school and went on the street, wore a hat that he only tapped without taking it off when he saw an acquaintance. It was customary in the family that for a birthday, the celebrating person could order his preferred menu. Eugen asked for bread and butter with black coffee. Eugen was not an eager traveler. After his end exams, he went to Paris and maybe also to Venice. He would accompany Hansi when she went to Nuremberg who joined the family for weekends in the country during the summer. This was the only time he walked with the children in nature, but for Lagbaomer. Like on May 7, 1939, he wrote to Avraham, I just came back from a trip with mother to the Sharka woods. Prem, 10 minutes walk, romantic scenes, threatening rocks, scenery, stream, bridge, two pubs, nature, two real cuckoo calls, one beggar, 12 minutes of mountain, where we bought a present for grandma, fresh spinach, and back with the tram. Between the lines, I can detect a sense of humor not unlike that of my father and Avraham. My father recalls only one occasion when they stayed in a hotel in Bad Reichenhall in Germany, where they treat with salt steams. In May 1940, Eugen wrote to Avraham, Today, mother and I visited the place where Rudy will get his ag agricultural training with the hope of getting kosher milk there. This was a long trip that will suffice me for three years. After the conquest of the Czech Republic by the German Reich, Eugen was expelled from school. Together with other teachers, he founded a private education and training association for Jewish children and was a teacher and an inspector on behalf of the community. At the same time, he gave lectures mostly to elderly women whom the children called the Middle Ages. That was the time that 17-year-old Avraham was sent to Eretz Israel. The day of his trip coincided with Passover and the Dayan did not want to rule if he could travel during the holiday or not. Eugen and Avraham decided that he should go, but set two fasting days for them to fast at the same time. He gave Avraham a list when he, when he left in which he wrote, among other things, important, health, Judaism, livelihood, religious studying, <clears throat> family, community work, education, never overestimate yourself. Be strong in matters and mellow in character. Wherever you go, look for a rabbi. Look for someone to study Gemara with. Do not eat straight away things that need to be checked. Look for an older friend. Trim your nails. He also gave him a list of birthdays and yard sites of the family. Date in the history of the Jewish people and a list of addresses of family and friends worldwide. Avraham treated this list as a testament. After Avraham left, there was an interesting correspondence between him and the family. Eugen comes out a bit different here. 
It is obvious that he worries about his 17-year-old eldest son and wants him to stay in an orthodox environment and do every effort to continue his religious studies. Most of the letters were written in his unique Hebrew that I'm unable to translate and still keep its Shakespearean-like quality. He compliments him about his religious conduct, asks about his well-being, if he has anger outbursts, and about his inner self. He also consults about Rudy, exp expressing his concern about him drifting towards a Mizrahi and talking only about Aliyah. In one letter he wrote, Shalom, Shalom to the one who is far from me, but close to my heart, my eldest son, Avraham, till 120. This is maybe the close that to I love you and miss you, he ever got. Eugen was arrested and questioned several times by the Gestapo. In July 1943, the family was deported to Theresienstadt. He wrote to Avraham in a Red Cross note, Today we go with the monies to Aunt Teresa. This was a code for Theresienstadt. Rosa, Gustl, all our friends are there. The mood is good. God will help. When they first arrived, Auntie and Eugen lived separately in men and women barracks. After a couple of months, Rudy and Max found a little room which they renovated for them and it became a center for the entire family. Rudy and Max visited them every day after work and other family members as well. Uncle Mami's son, Ernst, got engaged there. Uncle Bell came and others who came to discuss religion matters and philosophy. The caricature was made in Theresienstadt in 1943 by the painter Max Plachik, who made a living this way. When Avram first saw it, he was surprised to see his father with no beard. Eugen shaved his beard off before they went to Terezin because there was a rumor that people with beards were more apt to be picked upon. In a diary written in the ghetto by Gabriel Itali, a Dutchman, he mentions Eugen and Hansi quite often. On September 10, 1944, he wrote, Today we visited Professor Dr. Eugen Lieben, a formerly professor of ancient languages from Prague. He usually lies in bed due to tuberculosis. He's very religious and knowledgeable in Jewish science. A week later, on 18 and 19 September was Rosh Hashanah. Thanks to the hospitality of the Libans, there were relatively nice days. Ralph built a sukkah in the yard by the Libans. We ate there a few times. In the Saturday before Sukkot, I started taking lessons with Professor Lieben and Dr. Yaitelis, Uncle Bear told. It stopped now because of the transport of Professor Lieben. <coughs> Eugen and Hansi were deported to Auschwitz on October 23, 1944, directly to the gas chambers. Dear Grandma Ernestine, four children and 12 grandchildren you had, Mami and Eugen, Gustav and Rosa, Ernst, Gabi, Mina, Arthur, Rudy and Max, Felix and Leo, Anna, Otto, Trude and Eva. Of all the grandchildren, only Arthur, Avraham and Max Mordechai survived, came to Israel and built families that form today the tribe of Liban, Livni. I hope that somewhere up there, you all see us and smile a little smile. Love, Leora. Thank you very much, Leora. And if you have questions or would like to um, say something, you are invited to write in the chat and we will read it or let you speak if you would like to say something. You can find the chat down in the menu um, when you go over it with the, uh, with the mouse. Okay, I see there are no questions. So I thank you all for joining us. And, um, oh, I see that Michaela raised her hand. Okay. 
Just a moment, we will let you speak. <coughs> Michaela, you can unmute yourself. You have uh, down. Yes. It's, it's okay, okay now. Mm -hmm. uh, Leora, you could have added uh, the where the name Lieben comes from. I did in the beginning. I, I missed it probably. Okay, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I started with it. Can I you say it again? I didn't see that it was the expelling of Jews from Prague where it comes. Yeah, th that's what I said. Yes, sorry. I <laughs> okay. probably okay. didn't hear it. Okay, thanks. Okay, now we have another question. Uh, who were the other uncles that um, that uh, met in the Liebenschule? Oh, the, <laughs> uh, there was a, a there were four brothers. There was Gustav. A, Nanny, Gabriel and Rosa, her, Rosa was a sister and uh, her husband was also one of them. But I think in, even from the wider Lieben family, there were all, all in all 35 men. So there must have been more Liebens than, uh, than the four brothers and, uh, and their children. But I'm not uh, entirely sure. I can check it. Who asked that? Danny Kolsky. Danny Kolsky, okay. Hi, Danny. <laughs> there are many people here that I'm very excited to see. I, I won't start uh, calling you by name, but uh, this is very exciting. Are there any other questions? If somebody wants to say something? Charles Weiner. Wiener and Amira. Okay, so please unmute yourself. You can do it um, in the in the bar down in the screen. Amira, yeah. unmute yourself. Unmute. You 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 can do it on the left lower corner. You can unmute. Oh, okay. Sorry, it just didn't let me unmute. It said that the host had to unmute me. So thank you very much again, Leora, and not to be repetitive from, you know, uh, listening to your Hebrew presentation, uh, which was equally compelling and interesting. I, I just wanted to add the story that I said about your family and your uncles that my mother had told me about Erev Yom Kippur. And she said, you know, that uh, your uncle Mani, Dr. Mani was the, her family's doctor. Uh, he was a well-known physician in Prague and he would make house balls and so there are separate stories about that, but what she said about Erev Yom Kippur, that it was very impressive to see the Lieben family walk to their shul. And she specifically said that they were the only ones. I know you said that there were several, but uh, from her source, it was the only family that had their own shul and they wore tuxedos on Erev Yom Kippur with tall hats and walked in a line across. In other words, they took the entire sidewalk. They were very tall, she said, okay. uh, or at least her perception was that they were, because she was maybe a little girl at that time, and that they would walk um, to shul that way. Yeah, and because it looks tall, very dignified. Being tall is not one of our uh, uh, best. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, the Libans were not that tall. I don't know about the Manny's family, but uh, 
my father, his brother, far from tall. So it must have been her little girl's perception. Yeah. She also said dignified, tall and dignified. And it was a memory of Prague that she had from Erev Yom Kippur. Her family, my grandfather and so on, and, and our family went to the Pinkas synagogue on Erev Yom Kippur, but they would see them as they went yeah. to Shul. Sure. Thank you, Amira. Is there anybody else who would like to add or ask something? Yes, I have a question. Yes, please. Um, you mentioned in your presentation, and you actually showed a musical example, I think, by Zygmunt Schul. And yeah. you, you mentioned where this music was available, and I missed that. Could you tell me again, please? Yes, uh, I will have to consult my notes for a minute. Thank you. Uh, it, it might have been at the Jewish Museum, but I, I'm not yes. sure. One yes. of them is in the Jewish Museum. One of them is in the uh, in the uh, uh, Music Museum in Prague, mm -hmm. and one is in the National uh, in the National Library in Israel. There are three copies. One in the Music Museum in Prague, one in the Jewish Museum, and one in the National Library in Israel. Thank you so much. Who else? Okay, if there are no other questions, then I would like to... Please yes. unmute yourself. Charles Wiener, please unmute yourself. Yeah. I wanted to ask a question. Okay. Uh, I mean, actually, I wanted to add something because I wrote a book, University of the Abyss. And there I mentioned the lectures that uh, uh, were done in Theresienstadt by Eugen Lieben. The first one was in 1943 on August 25th, the history of the Prague Jewish community. And in March, uh, 1944, uh, there were a series of lectures, Jewish communities in Prague, Vienna, Berlin, Prague. <clears throat> and the, um, the Mordechai Livni, he actually wrote a big article, and this is in my book. Uh, and here's the book. Mordechai Livni is my father. Yeah, I know. Uh, that's why I'm here. I'm very thankful for your lecture. So this is actually a book. And this is an uh, article for three pages. So if you're interested, I can send you this. Please, I, I would like to. And how to send it to you? You can send it to Beit Terezin. I okay. work there. Ah, um, great. No problem. Yo, uh, we we do you. have the book. We do have the book in our library. Ah, okay. so, and I'm okay. glad to see you here, Elena, Thank with you us. Thank you much. And also Mori. This was nice to see you that you joined us on this lecture. Um, anybody else would like to add something or to ask? Thank you very much, Leora. Even though I heard, I heard the Hebrew, now I heard the English, and it still is really a very, very well done and well-researched piece of work. And Thank you, Leah. Uh, it's a nice memory for, for our family. Thank you, Leah. So Catherine, thank you. If you have to unmute. Catherine, Catherine Jackson, you have to unmute. I always forget that. I'm so sorry. I wanted to say thank you so much for such an enriching lecture because uh, I have family, my, my late grandfather on my mum's side and her brother, they were all exterminated. As you know, we, that's why we're with Victor Edenstadt. But I have absolutely no, no ancestral history like yours or photographs, which I find so sad because of my, I only have two granddaughters, but at least I have two granddaughters. And they live in Holland, actually, not here. And to be able to produce such a, a long and wonderful established history and to see, you know, what a large at the end, how you produce these fantastic photographs of, this amazingly huge family after everything, I think is fantastic. 
Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so is there anyone else who would like to say something or ask? Yeah. Yes, Michael I, Seligman. Yes, uh, Lyra, I wanted to thank you for the presentation. It was beautiful, very informative. You put a lot of hard work into it. And it was a pleasure seeing you after so many years. Yeah. I just want to tell you that, that uh, Michael Seligman is the son of uh, a girlfriend of my father. His first girlfriend. <laughs> Arthur Seligman I, from may... Australia. Excuse me? Arthur Seligman from Australia. No, no uh, my mother's uh, maiden name was uh, Kraus, and uh, she emigrated to Ecuador after the war, and uh, she met my father over there. Um, John Hill, Hill's done. She, did you want I, to say I, something? Yes, please, yes. Yeah, please do. Hello. Hi. Yes, thank you very much for your presentation. I, unfortunately, I, I missed the first half, but uh, mm -hmm. I found it really fascinating. And I wanted to ask you if you know, um, my grandfather was Jack Greenbaum. Oh. Um, and do you know the relationship of um, Max to Rudy? Because... Max wrote from Prague um, to my grandfather in 1946 or, or late 1945. He had been liberated by the Americans from Dakar. And he mentions Rudy and some other relatives in his letter. So I'm just wondering if you know who, who is Max? Max is my father. Okay, okay. My father, Rudy, was the, the uncle I never had. Okay. And, and your grandfather, I, your grandfather was the brother of my grandmother. Oh, uh, okay. Well, it's very lovely to meet you, and thank you so much for all this amazing information. I'd like to be able to watch the recording. Okay, the, for whoever yeah. wants, the, the lecture will be on the Beit Terezin site, uh, not today, but uh, in a few days. So if you missed the beginning and you want to watch, you're welcome to watch it. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you that very much. Yes, thank you. That would have been my next question because I missed the first 10 minutes as well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you very, very much for a lovely oh, evening. I, the, I wish you all good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. David Bradford. David Hello. Bradford, yeah. Hello. Um, I'm in Berkeley, California, and also missed the beginning because... I didn't look at my calendar to see what time it began. So I'm looking forward to being able to see it. So um, a couple of things. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with him, but my uncle now deceased um, was Adolf Benish. Uh, I know his picture is in Beit Terezin um, and his daughter is my first cousin. Um, all of us came from Prague and scattered all over the world. We almost ended up in South America, but ended up in the US instead. Um, I'm particularly interested in it because I inherited from my parents a lot of letters and documentation. And I have now spent my pandemic having them translated. So I have documents in five languages um, and letters. And now that they're translated, I have to figure out what to do with them. Um, and how to put them together. So uh, I'm you're looking welcome. You're welcome to, to forward them to Beit Terezin in, uh, in Israel. We have an archive and we will be very glad to have them. All right, well, I can send you the raw material uh, okay. and hopefully over the next few years, I'm gonna be able to 
put them together in a form that creates you something that was coherent. Dr. Bemish? Yes, Adolf yes. Bemish. He was... And he was liberated in, in Kaufring? Um, I don't know where he was liberated from, but I know he was one of I the... I know that my father was liberated with a Dr. Bennett who actually saved him because he forbade him to eat whatever the Americans gave them. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So it might be that, that he's the one. I will ask my father. Okay, well, there is, a, there is a picture of him. I've seen it when we visited. So that particular finish should be there. Uh, he was one of the... Elders, um, I think in Prague, I don't know if he was one of the elders in the ghetto. And uh, apparently what saved his life is somebody told him not to go on the coach that had the higher ranking people in it and to go on a regular coach and all the high ranking were killed on arrival. So he now has a family and grandchildren. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Leora. Bye bye. Thank you all. And you are invited to join us in our next um, lectures. We will publish the, uh, the subject and the dates uh, in, in a few days. Thank you and good night, everybody. Good night here in Israel and those of you. <laughs> good morning here. <laughs> and good, good morning to all the others. <laughs> Thank you bye very bye. much, Leora. Thank you, Leora. Bye-bye. Bye, Leitraut. Bye. 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 Bye.